if you're on Facebook, you're aware of what they call Facebook Watch. Facebook Watch has not always been a part of Facebook, but it's, it's, it's something fairly new that Facebook decided to get into the entertainment business because uh, as any successful business, you want to diversify yourself. You don't just want to have all your eggs in one basket, as they say. And so now you got Facebook Watch and you got uh, Facebook Market. You have all of these different branches, Facebook Messenger, uh, but Facebook Watch is an interesting one and it's one that I want to lift up because something happened about two weeks ago on Facebook Watch uh, that's in line with the series that we found ourselves in. As you know, if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, uh, you know that we are actually in a series on sin and we're dealing with different aspects of sin. And one of those aspects, one of those very important parts of sin is confession. Confession is essential uh, to this thing that we call sin. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse us, to forgive us, excuse me, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Confession is an essential part of this faith wall. We even have to confess unto faith for uh, if a man confess with his mouth and believe in his heart on the Lord Jesus, he shall be saved. Confession is a very vital part of this faith walk and is very essential to sin. Last week we dealt with uh, what I call confessions part one and we talked about the importance of confessing our sins to God. Today I want to deal with a different dynamic uh, and this is what brings me to Facebook Watch. This is what brings me here. About two weeks ago uh, uh, there's a very popular show on Facebook Watch called Red Table Talk. Uh, uh, this Red Table Talk show is very interesting. It's Jada Pinkett Smith. Uh, it's her mother and her daughter. That's kind of how it started off. Uh, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, her mother and her daughter. And on this uh, Red Table Talk, they have deep discussions. They talk about uh, sometimes very provocative topics. They talk about what's going on in the world. But, but about two weeks ago, Jada Pinkett Smith made an announcement because uh, some allegations came out uh, that she was involved in something that none of us really thought Jada Pinkett Smith would be involved in. Uh, uh, and so she says about two weeks ago, I'm bringing myself to the table. I'm bringing myself to the table. In other words, what she was saying is, I have a confession to make. Red Table Talk, I found out, did a little homework, they have about 9.6 million followers of that page. That means 9.6 million people have hit the subscribe button to that page because they want to be alerted anytime something happens on Red Table Talk. Now, that's a high number, but, but two weeks ago when she called herself to the table, that number, uh, the number of people who viewed the video was 34.6 million. 9.6 million people follow the page, but 34.6 million people have viewed the video. What that tells me is that it wasn't just the people who follow her page, but there were some newcomers when she said, I have a confession to make. Uh, uh, the, the confession that she made was that she had found herself in an entanglement. She wouldn't call it what it is, but she said she found herself in an entanglement. And so I did a little more homework. Technology is amazing. I did some homework, and that term entanglement had a 1% interest on Google from July 28, 2019 to July 4th, 2020. But on July 5th, something amazing happened. That word entanglement jumped up to 60% from July 5th to the 11th. Wait, it gets even better. It spiked again to 100% from July 12th to July 18th. Why? Because somebody had a confession. Which brings me to my point. Everyone loves a confession, but no one likes to confess. We love tuning in to the confessions of other people, but we hate confessing our faults. But the Bible lets us know that it's not enough to confess to God. We dealt with that last week, 1 John. But, but, but there's a command given by James 
to confess to one another. I, just to give you a little background on this book, the book of James, for those who don't know, the book of James is written by the brother of Jesus James. This, this is that James. This is the James who grew up with Jesus. This is the James who had a high position in the church of Jerusalem. This James is writing the, uh, uh, this letter, this epistle, uh, to the believers who had been scattered during that time. Uh, one, one of the interesting facts about the book of James is that it's almost like a New Testament book of Proverbs. James is a very practical person. He doesn't over-spiritualize stuff. He's just direct and to the point. He gives tidbits of wisdom on how to live like a Christian. And one of the things he says that is essential to being a Christian is that you gotta know how to confess. Not just to God, but to your brothers and sisters. If I were to give today's sermon a title, it would simply be Confessions Part 2. Confessions Part 2. The first part of our confession deals with what we say to God, but the second part of our confession deals with what we say to one another. Now, I want to tackle this from a couple of different angles. First, I want to look at what does it mean to confess? We're going to reiterate that from last week. And also, I want to look at why we don't do it. And then after we uh, uh, discover what it is and why we don't do it, I want to give you a couple of benefits. I, I know that sounds strange, but like how can I benefit from telling folks my business? But the Bible lets us know there's some benefits uh, to confessing Excuse me, to one another. What does it mean to confess and why don't we do it? Uh, just like last week, I went to Easton's Bible Dictionary because when you're defining things from a biblical perspective, you, you can't just jump to what man got to say about it. I want to know what the Bible says about it. And so I went to Easton's Bible Dictionary and Easton's Bible Dictionary defines the word confess uh, or confession as an open profession of faith. That's the positive. But then it also defines it as an acknowledgement of sins to God and to a neighbor whom we have wronged. That sounded good, and so I went to Merriam-Webster, and Merriam-Webster defines it as to tell or make known something such as something wrong or damaging to oneself. Yes, sir. Not only that, uh, uh, it, it is to admit, uh, to acknowledge sin to God or to a priest or to declare faith in or adherence to, and here's the one I love from last week, and I love it even more this week, to give evidence to. I want you to write that one down. Uh, uh, to confess is to give evidence to. It's, it's to present evidence. And, and I would suggest that this is the first reason that we don't like confessing our sins to one another. Why? Because we don't like giving evidence that will be used against us. If you've ever watched that show Cops, or if you've ever gotten in trouble with the law, one of the things that they will do as they're putting you in handcuffs is read you what they call the Miranda rights. They say, you have the right to remain silent. Why? Because anything you say or do can and will be used against you. And so what they're doing is pushing you to exercise your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent so that you don't incriminate yourself. Now, however, James tells us to do the opposite. It. It's amazing how the kingdom of God is always opposite and contrary to how we do things in the world. Even though cops tell us to exercise our right to remain silent, James says, revoke your right to remain silent. I need you to say something. Why? This brings me to my first thought. The one thing keeping some of us from breaking our cycles is we refuse to break our silence. I'm going to say that again. Uh, the one thing keeping some of us from breaking our cycles is we refuse to break our silence. We are so worried about how people are going to use our words against us, how they're going to use our testimony against us, how they're going to use what they know about us against us, that we stop confessing. The Catholic Church does a good job of this. They, they confess on a regular basis, but the Protestant church, we've gotten to a place where we don't confess because I'm so scared of what the pastor is going to think about me. I'm so scared of what the usher is going to say about me. I'm so scared of what my neighbor is going to think about me. And so I'm not going to give you evidence because I don't want you to use my evidence against me. And so we don't confess. But the problem is, again, uh, uh, 
the one thing that keeps us from breaking our cycles as we refuse to break our silence. James lets us know that one of the keys to breaking our cycles is breaking our silence. That, that, that if I want to see something happen in my life, I got to say something in my life. I got to confess to somebody. And some of us keep going around the same mountain over and over and over again. Why? Because God is just waiting on you to break your silence. And some of us start feeling a way in our heart. Don't nobody see me struggling. Don't nobody see me going through. Well, no, baby, we need you to say something. We are glad to help you break that cycle, but I'm going to need you to break your silence. Pastor Mike is not just prescribing this, but Jesus' brother is describing this. James says you got to say something. It's to give evidence of. But I, I want to go a little deeper, and so I went to the Greek, not just to be deep, but I want to know what they had in mind. When they said this, and so Strong's Concordance lets me know that this is a Greek word that's actually different from the Greek word last week. Last week, there was a Greek word where we were confessing to God, but this week, there's a different Greek word uh, where we're uh, confessing to one another. That Greek word is exomalagia. Exomalagia. Now, what's interesting is even though it's a different word, it still somewhat means the same thing, and that's to agree. So to confess my sin is to agree. And this brings up the second reason we don't like to confess our sins, because we don't like to agree with the reality that we don't accept. When I confess my sin, I'm agreeing that my sin is what it is. And many of us, and we allow the devil to whisper in our ear, many of us try to make excuses. Many of us try to twist and warp what we do. No, baby, sin is sin. Uh, the Bible lets us know that we are to be ye holy as God is holy. Uh, holiness is still right. And any time I miss the mark of holiness, it is sin. If I miss it high, it's sin. If I miss it low, it's sin. If I miss it far, it's sin. If I miss it close, it's sin. Sin is sin. And we don't like to confess because if I confess, I'm coming into agreement with the reality that I don't accept. And many of us have painted such a beautiful picture of what our reality is, we don't want to tarnish it with what it truly is. And so we don't confess because to, to confess is to agree with something we have not accepted. One of the things I shared last week uh, that I appreciate about AA meetings is from day one, they create an atmosphere where you can be transparent. Uh, uh, the first person introduces themselves as, hi, my name is, and I am a fill in the blank. Whatever their name is, they tell you. They identify themselves, but then they identify their issue, and they sit in a circle, and they go around the circle, and everyone says, listen, this is who I am and this is my issue. Catch the revelation there. I am an individual, but I have an issue. I am not my issue. I'm an individual with an issue, but I'm not going to ignore the reality that I have an issue, but my issue does not define who I am. And so they create a circle of trust where all of us are sharing who we are, but also what we struggle with, and nothing leaves the circle. We don't confess because we don't like to agree with what we have not accepted. Now we've looked at what it is, you know, what it means, and we've looked at why we do it. I, I wanna give you three benefits. I, I wanna give you three benefits of confessing our sins to one another. I, today I wanna challenge you to call yourself to the table. Uh, the three benefits of confessing our sins to one another. The first benefit to confessing our sins to one another is that confession allows us to relate. I'm going to give you three R's today. Confession allows us to relate. Confession allows us to relate. What do I mean? Verse 16 starts off, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Again, confess your faults, not just to God, but one to another and pray one for another. Now, why is this important? Why is it that God would require us to confess our sins to one another? There are some folks who say, listen, I've confessed my faults to God and only God can judge me. So only God needs to know. But the Bible says otherwise. It says, listen, 
You can confess your faults to God and that's cool, but I still need you to confess them to one another. And the reason behind that is because on this journey, we are not just trying to learn how to love God, but we're trying to learn how to love one another. And I can't just love the good part of you. I got to love, as Chris Rock say, the crust of a person. We love to pull the crust off the bread. But the truth is, I don't really know who you are until I've tasted your crust. And so if I don't love you the way the Bible tells me to love you, I need to know what your crust is. I, the white part is good. The white part is smooth and soft. But but, but what's those jagged things in your life? What, what's those hard, crunchy things in your life? What, what are those things that I really don't want to deal with? I, I, I can't say I love you if I try to remove the crust from you. And so we have to confess to one another. Because it's really the only way we can love one another. While we were yet sinners, is what the Bible says. God loved us and gave his son. And so who are we to love everything about one another except our bad parts? But confession allows us the opportunity to relate. We can relate to one another. Now, how does confessing to one another help us to relate to one another? Well, uh, I'm going to give this to you in two parts. The first way confession allows us to relate to one another is that confession reminds us what we all have in common. That when we confess to one another, the first thing or the first way it allows us to relate to one another is it reminds us what we all have in common. We, 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 we may have many differences. Some of us uh, are more affluent. We, we might have some money. Some of us, uh, we, we might be a little broke right now. We, we really ain't got two nickels to rub together. Some of us uh, come from a fancy lifestyle. Some of us come from a little ratchet lifestyle. Some of us are black and some of us are white. Uh, some of us are Republicans and some of us are Democrats. But, but, but the Bible lets us know that we all got one thing in common and we find it in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If I don't have nothing else in common with you, I at least got one thing in common with you, and that is that I have sinned. I have missed the mark of God. We all got something in common. Don't matter how you vote, we all have sinned. Don't matter how much money in your account, we all have sinned. No matter how nice your clothes are, we all have sinned. No matter how cute your dance is on Sunday, we all have sinned. And come Confession allows us to relate to one another because it reminds us of the one thing we all have in common. All have sinned, all have missed the mark and come short of this goal of holiness, which brings me to my next thought. I'm going to step on some toes with this one. Uh, send your angry letters uh, to the church administrator. One of the struggles of today's church is that we no longer confess Monday's mess. We simply cover it with Sunday's best. My God, can I say that one more time? One of the struggles of today's church is that we no longer confess Monday's mess. We simply cover it with Sunday's best. Uh, the problem our church is facing and the reason, can I be honest, the reason the world don't trust us is because we don't confess Monday's mess. We just uh, cover it with Sunday's best. They walk in the church and they can't relate to nobody because everybody got on their Sunday's best. Nobody comes to the presence of God naked. I was sharing with a brother yesterday. The Bible lets us know in Genesis chapter 2, I got it on my ring. For this reason shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto to his wife and the two shall be one flesh but it ends this way and the man and his wife were naked and had no shame it's amazing to me that we come to the house of God and we are not naked we are not in the state by which he has made us all of us are coming to church with a mask I remember preaching a Halloween sermon called Christians in costume that some of the best costumes you'll find for Halloween are in your local church on Sunday morning folks come to the church and they can't relate to nobody because everybody has dressed up their Monday's mess with their Sunday's best and I feel like I'm the only one going through what I'm going through and this is why it's important to confess because I need to know I'm not alone, that I'm not the only person who marriage going through, that I'm not the only person that struggles in my flesh, that I'm not the only person that got trouble controlling my tongue, that I'm not the only person that gets overly angry at folks and want to fight. Does anybody relate to my struggle? And so the first reason, the first benefit of confessing is it makes us relatable. My bishop likes to say, some, uh, say something all the time. Some of us are so heavenly minded 
that we're no earthly good, that we can't relate to where someone is because we done forgot where we came from. We all are the whosoevers in John 3.16. And so when we come to church on Sunday, we don't have to have our Sunday's best. We can come naked. This is the benefit of being a son and a daughter of God, that I can be naked before my parents. We can be naked before the Father. He created us to be naked and not ashamed. But folks are sitting in God's house on Sunday morning and they're ashamed of their nakedness. Why? Because everybody else is covered up. And so if everybody else is covered up and I find God in a place where everyone is covered up, then I cover up because covering up is now the normal. And we don't really love each other. We love our representatives. One of the struggles of today's church is that we no longer confess Monday's mess. We simply cover it with Sunday's best. And it makes us unrelatable to the world. Now, I'm not telling you that you give all the nasty details of your past just to win folks to Christ. No. But when you see that sister come in who's a single mother and she's struggling to get a hold of her child. Don't talk about her and say she don't have no control over her kids. But remember when you was a single parent before your child grew up and you was having trouble taking care of them and you go sit on that back row with her and you say, baby, I've been down this road. I've been here before, but the Lord cleaned me up and the Lord turned my son into a pastor. He did a new thing, something we didn't see coming. And the same God that raised my child up, helped me raise my child up in the way he should go is the same God that's going to help you raise yours up. Why? Because I'm going to walk this with you. You are not alone. Yes. One of the hardest parts of this Christian walk is trying to rebuke the whisper of the enemy telling me that I'm the only one who struggles with this. That's how he gets us. And this is why uh, when we were gathering, the enemy would love to keep believers at home. So that he could continue to remind them, you're the only one going through this. No one else has been through this but you. No one else has overcome this but you. But this is why we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Because somebody's been down the road I'm on. Somebody struggled with what I struggled with. And here's the good news. God has brought them out. And the same God that brought them out is the same God that can bring me out. We struggle. Because we don't confess Monday's mess. We cover it with Sunday's best. I remember I was in math class, I'm going to give you an analogy. I was in math class, I can't remember what year it was in school, but I was in math class, and the teacher was teaching something. And I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't even know what she was talking about. And I looked around the room and it seemed like everybody was getting it. The teacher was teaching, and, and here's what they were doing. And I'm sitting there like, well, I must be missing. I don't know what she's talking about. Folks are nodding their head. I saw folks writing, so I'm like, they must be taking some amazing notes. Uh, I don't know what this woman is talking about. And, and so finally she says, any questions? And I said, yes, ma'am, I, I, I got a question. She was like, uh, well, yes, sir, what's, what's your question? I said, ma'am, I don't know what you, I don't get it. Can you explain it again? And the teacher does something amazing. She, she looks around the room and she says, does anybody else feel the same way? And one at a time, everybody started going, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about either. Uh, yeah, I, I just was going to cheat on the test. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I was the only one that confessed because I thought I was the only one who was struggling. Uh, other folks were putting on a facade that they were getting something that they weren't getting. That they were putting on a performance that they understood something that they did not understand. But because I was willing to confess, other folks began to confess. And, and we realized in that moment that no matter what where we were uh, uh, on the school totem pole, uh, the athlete did not get it. The cheerleader did not get it. The punk rocker did not get it. The nerd didn't even get it. We all had one thing in common, and that was that we were struggling. And if we would get to a place as believers that we remind ourselves by confessing that, listen, I ain't got it. I've been doing this thing for a while, but I still haven't mastered it. I got to struggle. And when we confess to one another, it gives us an opportunity to relate that, listen, I ain't got it, you ain't got it, 
So let's come together and get it together. Confession reminds us what we all have in common, but not only that, confession repositions us into the seat we belong in. I'm going to say that again. Confession repositions us, and I'm still on the first point. Confession repositions us into the seat we belong in. Confession is it's like musical chairs. It, it moves me from this seat to that seat. Confession removes me from the seat I'm in to the seat I belong in. What, what, what do I mean by that? If you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 8, something interesting happens. Some uh, uh, Sadducees and Pharisees and religious folks, uh, they bring this woman to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Now, we can argue back and forth about what that means and how you catch somebody in the act. I got an idea and that's very indicting to them, but we're going to leave that where it's at. But they say, we caught this woman in the act of adultery and they throw her down to Jesus and they say, the law says this, but what say you? And they're ready to stone her because they know that the law calls for her to be stoned. However, the law also calls for the other party to be stoned, but somehow that brother was missing. So they got their stones in their hand and they're ready to stone her. And Jesus says something amazing. Uh, Jesus, he first he stoops down and starts writing some stuff in the dirt. And so they call him again. They're like, uh, did you hear us? Uh, what say you? And Jesus looks up and he says, he that is without sin. Cast the first stone. And something amazing happens. They, they start playing musical chairs. They jump out of the judgment seat and they start sitting in the mercy seat. And this brings me to my next thought. When we confess our sins to one another, it moves us all out of the judgment seat and moves us all to the mercy seat. That we go from this place of prosecution to this place of pleading for mercy. Why? Because now I'm in the seat I belong. The, the fact that I got evidence on you and you got evidence on me means that we all in the same seat. Yes. And so James says, listen, give each other your evidence. Because if everybody got everybody evidence, can't nobody sit in the judgment seat. Everybody has to sit in the mercy seat. And the Bible lets me know that only one person belongs in the judgment seat, and that is the righteous judge. And if I am not the righteous judge, if you are not the righteous judge, then you might as well take a seat in the mercy seat. Why? Because you can't sit in both seats at the same time. Either you're going to sit in the judgment seat, and you're going to catch your judgment, or you're going to sit in the mercy seat, and you're going to plead for the mercy of God, I told you last week, uh, my wife and I were watching a movie called Reasonable Doubt with Samuel L. Jackson. Really good movie. And what, what I like about this movie is it puts you in a moral dilemma because you have a man uh, who's a, a prosecutor who's guilty of murdering somebody. But that prosecutor has to prosecute the man who was torturing the person he murdered. And so who do you cheer for in this movie? Do you cheer for the person who was torturing but did not murder that he gets off uh, of a crime that he really didn't commit? Or do you cheer for the prosecutor uh, uh, who actually committed the murder but he's prosecuting somebody who didn't really do it? You, you have this moral dilemma. And there's a scene in that movie where the prosecutor, uh, instead of prosecuting him, he pretty much starts defending him. And the reason he's defending him is because he knows that there's evidence Evidence against him. And so because he knows there's evidence against him, uh, uh, and there's also evidence against this brother, he can't really prosecute him, so they both have to sit in the mercy seat. And this is the situation and the chair that God is calling his people to, that we all sit in the mercy seat, that we plead for one another, that we don't throw stones at one another, but that we bring our stones together and build God a house. That's a word right there. That we don't throw our stones at one another, but we bring our stones together and build God a house. Why? Because can't none of us sit in the mercy seat? We got to sit in the, uh, excuse me, can't sit in the judgment seat. We got to sit in the mercy seat. Uh, the church should be filled not with pastor seat, not with mother seats, but with mercy seats. Ain't no special seats in the house of God. We all just sitting in mercy seats. We confess our sins to one another because it gives us an opportunity to relate. Not only that, point number two, confession allows us to rehabilitate. So confession allows us to relate, but then confession also allows us to rehabilitate. Now, for some of you who don't know what that word means, it's just a fancy way of saying healing. Verse 16, it says that ye may be healed. 
He says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. Why? That he may be healed. So James suggests that a part of my healing process is confession. That, that if I'm going to be healed, I can't just tell God about it. I got to tell somebody on earth about it. That, that's a part of my healing. I'm one of those ones. I don't believe it's in the Bible just to be there. If it's in there, it means something. And again, let's remember who's writing this. This is James, the brother of Jesus. He's the practical preacher. This is the New Testament Proverbs. He's teaching us how to live holy. He says, listen, if you're going to be holy, if you're going to be healed, then you need to confess this thing to somebody. Now, how does this help us to heal? How does this help us to rehabilitate? Uh, well, the first way is that confession allows us to release. The way we're able to rehabilitate when we confess our sins to one another is uh, it, it allows us to release. Hebrews 12 and 1 says it this way. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us. It allows us to release. It allows us to let go of the weight. If you ever carried around something that you couldn't tell anybody, you know it's this heavy weight. It's the weight of sin. It weighs you down. It slows you down. You, you can't move in the things of God the way you used to move in the things of God. You, you, you can't build like you need to build. Why? Because you have this excess weight that is weighing you down. And so uh, when we confess, I believe that one of the ways that we lay aside the sin, that we lay aside the weight, is by by confessing, by releasing that thing to somebody else. Uh, and there's so many of us who are weighed down by things that we haven't told anybody because we're so worried about them judging us. We're so worried about them condemning us. Uh, it, it blows my mind. I'm reminded of the scene in that Red Table Talk where Will talks about the need to be connected to somebody where that you can confess things to and not have to worry about losing everything. And this is the trouble we found ourselves in. We're we're scared to confess anything because we feel like it's going to cost us everything. I'm going to say that again. Many of us are scared to confess anything because we're scared it's going to cost us everything. That, that if I share the deepest, darkest parts of my heart, that, that you're going to walk out of my life, that you're going to start talking about me, that, that you're going to start looking at me funny, that you're going to start preaching on me, that, that I'm going to start losing opportunities. Why? Just because I shared my struggle. It allows us to release to one another. Why is that important? I remember I broke my ankle. I was in eighth grade, eighth grade, eighth grade, sixth grade. No, eighth grade. I was in eighth grade. I was in eighth grade and I broke my ankle. And the, the, the heavy thing about breaking the ankle is that when you break your ankle, what you're told is that you can't put weight on the ankle. Now, the problem is I'm so used to putting weight on that ankle that I now have to develop a new habit of not putting weight on the ankle. Now, it would have been weird for the doctor to tell me not to put weight on my ankle, but then not give me a solution to help me not put weight on the ankle. And so they prescribed me some crutches. And so they gave me crutches so that I could stop trusting what I used to put my weight on and start releasing the weight to something else. Now the problem is, I wasn't used to walking with crutches. And so I had to learn how to trust my crutches. And it was a slow process, but, but over time, as, as, as the crutches showed me that it could support my weight, as the crutches showed me that I didn't have to go back to what I was used to doing, that I could take a break and, and I could put the weight on them, uh, I began to trust my crutches. And as I trust my crutches, watch this, I was able to heal in that broken place. I didn't have to stay broken because I had a crutch in my life. And this brings me to my next point. Uh, one of the reasons we remain broken by sin as we don't believe we have crutches strong enough to handle our confessions. I'm going to say that again. One of the reasons we remain broken by sin is we don't believe we have crutches strong enough to handle our confessions. I want to ask you a question. Who's your crutch? I had to sit and look at this thing because I'm a pastor and I'm everybody's crutch. But then I had to look and see how many crutches I had. And this is what gets a lot of pastors in trouble is they become everybody's crutch and they get broken by the weight of being everybody's crutch. And then when they're broken, they have no one to, to, to be their crutch. And so now they stay broken and that thing never heals. And we turn on the news and we find that a pastor is found in a hotel in a drug overdose because he was everybody's crutch and he didn't have any crutches. Everyone could confess to him. 
but he couldn't confess to anybody. Who's your crutch? And I want to challenge you that if you got a phone full of numbers and you ain't got no crutches, you might as well delete everybody in there. Who's your crutch? Who's your crutch? A part of our healing process is having people in our lives that we can release the weight of our sin to. And and here's here's the thing. I don't release it to them to save me from it. I release it to them to help me heal. See, I release it to God to save me from it. I release it to you to help me heal. In other words, God, I'm giving it to you because really only you can do something about it. But while I'm waiting on you to do something about it, God, send me some crutches. Why? Because if not, I'm going to keep putting weight on it. And if I keep putting weight on it, I'm going to stay broken in this thing. And watch this. If I stay broken in it, it might break my children. Who are your crutches? We confess to one another because it shows us who our crutches are. Not only that, but confession, it, it, it allows us to release But then confession also allows us to be released. I'm going to say that again. Confession doesn't just allow us to release, but confession allows us to be released. James 8.32 says, "And uh, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Uh, Jesus is talking about himself. I am the truth. And he says, listen, once you know me and you have a firm grip of me, it'll make you free. Uh, Not give you the option of being free. But when you know the truth, the truth will thrust you into freedom. It'll make you free. And and this is true about truth in general, that that, that when we uh, know the truth, when we conform to the truth, the truth will make us free. And the problem is the truth sometimes is ugly. I can cover the truth and remain bound by it, or or I can expose the truth and be made free. Brings me to my next thought. Stop allowing other people's immaturity to keep you incarcerated. Stop allowing other people's immaturity to keep you incarcerated. In other words, listen, set yourself free. Testify about your struggle. God, I am struggling with this. Neighbor, I am struggling with this. And I'm not going to allow your immaturity towards my struggle to keep me incarcerated. It is sad to say that some of the believers who declare the scripture that whom the sun set free is free indeed ain't free indeed. They're bound by the opinions of their neighbor. They're bound by the words of their neighbor. They're bound by the thoughts of their neighbor. They can't be absolutely free because they, they were too worried about what their neighbor's going to say about them, what they're going to post about them on social media, the rumors and gossip that will go around about them because they shared their struggle. Uh, Stop allowing other people's immaturity to keep you incarcerated. I want to encourage you today to set yourself free, to declare, listen, this is my struggle and I'm not going to keep allowing people to keep me bound in this thing because I'm so worried about how you're going to respond to it. We don't have testimony services anymore because everybody's scared to testify. People are so worried about what someone's going to say. I remember seeing a uh, a video on social media. The lady, uh, you can tell she was probably under the influence of something, uh, but she gets up to testify and she starts oversharing some of her struggles to the point that it started to make the people there uncomfortable. And listen, don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, There should be some reverence in God's house. But but this was a lady that y'all just took off the street. This was a lady that you told your God could heal her. This was a lady that you said your God could free her from what she was in. And you get you get her up on stage. You give her a mic to talk to talk about what God is doing for. And she starts sharing the ugly things and you cut her mic off and you escort her back to her seat. There are some truths that need to come out because now. I know how to deal with you. Now I know how to cover you. Now I know how to pray for you. It may make me uncomfortable, but watch this. I'd rather be uh, free and offend you than to be bound and offend God. Do we give everybody a mic? No. But do we create an atmosphere where they can share anything? Listen, this is what I'm struggling with. 
This uh, is something I can't stop doing. This is a habit that I have. Uh, this is something that I just can't shake. It, it may not be your struggle, but it's my struggle. And can I at least release it to you so that I can be released from this thing? Or do I have to continue to be a prisoner because I'm worried about can you handle what I'm carrying? I remember uh, I was in Detroit and I think I fell off a scooter if I'm not mistaken. But if you ever catch me in shorts, you're going to notice that I got a scar right here on my knee. And this scar was a very deep scar. It's a scar that I got. And I really just tried to cover it because I didn't want to get in trouble. I was away from mom. I was, you know, out in a different state, didn't know how to handle it, got immature. And so I was like, listen, I I'm not going to address this wound. I I'm going to just cover it the best I can. And so I get home and my mom like, what in the world that happened to your knee? And, and so she starts treating my knee and, and she starts covering it. She throws a little peroxide on it, a little neosporin, dress it up real nice, and it's covered. Yes. And so I get used to her covering the wound every night. But then there came a time where she didn't cover it anymore. And I'm like, Mom, you, you got to cover this thing. And my mom dropped a little wisdom on me. She's like, son, uh-uh. The only way it's going to completely heal is you got to leave it uncovered for a little bit. You, you got to expose this thing if you really want it to be healed. I, we can keep covering it, but watch this. If you keep it in, it's going to start infecting other stuff. And this is the problem. We're holding on to things that are starting to affect other areas of our lives because we don't have a release. Folks are going through in their mind. Folks are going crazy. Folks are losing their jobs. Folks are turning violent because they're holding on to secrets that they, that they don't have anybody to release to, and because they can't uncover that thing, it starts to infect everything around it. Mm, my God. Mom says, son, I know it's ugly. Mm. And, and I know you're embarrassed by it. But covering ain't going to fix it. Mm. You're going to have to get over the embarrassment. You're going to have to get over the ugliness. And you're going to have to expose that thing so that it can heal. And today I want to encourage somebody to find somebody in your life, pray, tell the Lord to send somebody so that you can expose some things. A, a show enough believer, somebody who's going to love you with the I pray the Lord send somebody because some of us, it's starting to affect certain areas of our life. God is trying to move. God is trying to use us to do amazing things and we're messing up what God is trying to do because we're covering too many things and it's starting to infect the work that God wants to do. Declare that this is the year that you will no longer allow the immaturity of others to keep you incarcerated. Let, I'm going to expose this thing. Why? Because my life depends on it. I'm going to expose this thing. Why? Because my ministry depends on it. I'm going to expose this thing. Why? Because my marriage depends on it. I'm going to expose this thing. Why? Because my friendship depends on it. I'm going to expose this thing. Why? Because raising my kids depends on it. Yes. Confession allows us to rehabilitate. The reason some of us have not healed properly is because we won't confess. We won't expose some things, some struggles in our lives. We give you one more and we're going home. Confession allows us to become real prayer warriors. That's our last one. Confession allows us to become real prayer warriors. When you look at uh, James chapter 5, uh, verses 13 to 16, that particular section is really just about effective prayer. He's, he's trying again. He's a practical preacher. He's saying, listen, if you're going to be an effective prayer warrior, this is what you need to do. And a part of the strategy of being an effective prayer warrior is you got to confess your faults one to another. He's not talking to one particular individual. He's talking about a body. He says, listen, if y'all are going to be the prayer warriors that God is calling you to be, y'all got to confess to one another. Why? Let's look at the text. He says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There's a couple of points of emphasis here. It's effectual, fervent prayer. It's not just fervent prayer. It's effectual prayer. That word effectual is from the root effect. It has to be effective prayer. And might I suggest that the church has gotten real good at fervent prayer, but we don't pray effective prayer. He says a part of the effective strategy of praying effective prayers is you got to know what you're praying about. How does confession help, uh, help our prayer lives? Simply put, confession helps us to recognize our enemies. Confession allows us to recognize the enemy. Uh, 
when I confess, I'm, I'm going to start with me first. When I confess my faults, what I'm doing is opening up my mouth and I'm making known, I'm verbalizing that this is my enemy. So when I say, you know what? I'm struggling. Uh, 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 I'm struggling with drugs. I'm making known, I'm verbalizing that this is the enemy of my soul. If I say I'm struggling in my flesh, I can't stop looking at, at, at half naked women. I'm verbalizing and making known that this is the enemy of my soul. Why is this important? The moment we confess our sins, we stop dancing with it and start declaring war on it. I'm going to say that again. The moment we confess our sins, we stop dancing with it and we start declaring war on it. So once I declare, once I speak openly out of my mouth that this is my strength, struggle, I am actually declaring war on that thing. I'm declaring war on, on stealing. I'm declaring war on lying. I'm declaring war on coveting. I'm de declaring war on gossip. I'm declaring war on viewing my neighbor negatively. I'm declaring war on, on whatever that thing is. Why? Because I'm opening up my mouth. I'm making a declaration that this is an enemy of mine. And the moment I do that, I stop dancing with it. And I declare war on it because now I've spoken that thing. I've identified that thing that me and this thing, we got to fight that, that, that you and I got to come. We, we got to come back. We got to make this thing uh, uh, into something. We, we got to throw hands, as we like to say in this generation. Why? Because I've declared war on you. Not only that, but confession helps us to recognize the enemy of others. So uh, uh, when I confess my fault, I'm identifying my enemy. But when you confess your fault to me, you're letting me know that this is your enemy. Why is this important? Because this is what allows me uh, 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 to really become a prayer warrior. I've identified my enemy, which is that's important first. Now I know who I'm in war with. But then because you're my brother, y'all know how we used to do back in the day. You mess with this one, you mess with me. And so it's one of those situations where it's like, listen, I know that this is my enemy, but I also know that this is your enemy. And if it's your enemy, it's now my enemy. Why? Next thought. Believers are not called to be investigators. We're called to be intercessors. We're not called to be investigators. We're called to be intercessors. That's important because oftentimes what happens is when we get wind of somebody's shortcoming, we start investigating. Again, I just told you uh, 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 that that word entanglement, the moment she confessed, Jada Pinky confessed uh, that she had an entanglement with this brother, it shot up from 1% interest to 60% interest overnight. Everybody started searching, what is an entanglement? What does it mean to be in an entanglement? And I'm going to be honest with you, I was guilty too. Once I found out, I was like, Lord, what in the world is an entanglement? I, I ain't never even thought about the word entanglement. And the Holy Spirit had to catch me and say, you investigating her sin, but why you ain't interceding for her sin? And this is the problem that we found ourselves in. Somebody confesses their sin, or someone gets caught in their sin, and Instead of interceding for them, we start investigating them. We want to know who you did it with. We want to know how long you've been doing it. We want to know what doing it actually means. We start investigating, but God is saying, no, I need you to intercede. The same way you go to war with your enemy, I need you to go to war with their enemy. I need you to intercede for them. How many times have we become aware of something and we investigated, but we didn't intercede on it? It identifies not only my enemy, but it identifies my neighbor's enemy. Why is this important? There's a book by Sun Tzu called The Art of War. And I'm going to read you a quote from The Art of War. It's, it's one of the most quoted parts of the book. It says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. I'm going to say that again. If you know the enemy, and if you know yourself, you need not fear the results of 100 battles. What Sun Tzu is saying here is that if you know what you're capable of and you know what your enemy is capable of, you're going into war uh, 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 
uh, the way you need to. You're going into war equipped. Uh, as the Bible says this way, you're going into war with the full armor of God. You've properly equipped yourself because you know your enemy's strategies. You know how big your enemy is. You understand who your enemy is. Uh, one of the weirdest things uh, is when someone says, listen, I need you to pray for me. And you say, what do you need me to pray for? And they're like, well, I just pray. Uh, let the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. No, the Bible says confess it. Why? Because when you confess it, I can pray effectively. You got me over here praying for healing and you got a lust problem. Uh-uh. I'm fighting the wrong enemy. No commander would send a soldier into war and say just figure out who the enemy is. There will be casualties everywhere. So if, we, if that don't work in real war, how does that work in spiritual warfare? No. When you won't confess to me what you're asking me to pray about, you're sending me into war with an enemy I don't know. He said, if you're going to be a real prayer warrior, confess to one another. And so if somebody asks you to pray, you got Pastor Mike permission. I told you all this on Bible study night. You got Pastor Mike permission. Somebody asks you to pray, but they won't tell you what to pray for. You say, listen, go find somebody you can trust it with then. Because I need to pray effectively. I, I, you, I'm not going to go into spiritual warfare ill-equipped. I'm not going to go into the spiritual warfare fighting unnecessary things when you can just tell me the one enemy I'm supposed to be fighting. If a commander won't send his soldier into a war without saying, this who you're going to get, then don't send me into spiritual warfare and not tell me who I'm going after. Yes. And if you can't tell me who I'm going after, then tell somebody you trust with that enemy. And that just lets me know where I stand with you. I'm going to still pray for you, but, but that just lets me know where you and I are. We ain't at that level. And that's okay, but find somebody that can pray effectively for you. Yes. Fervency doesn't get me healed. It's the effectiveness. It don't matter how hard I punch this wall if me and this wall ain't got a problem. If I got a problem with a person and I punch the wall, punching the wall don't affect the person. And it's the same thing with prayer. I can pray around that thing all day, but until I can hit that thing, I'm not knocking on anything. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. Confession allows us to become real prayer warriors. I'm going to give you one more. We're going home. Confession allows us opportunity to rejoice. And I'm closing right there. Confession allows us opportunity to rejoice. What do I mean? Uh, uh, that Greek word that I told you about, exalamajeo, uh, exalamajeo, that, that Greek word uh, doesn't just mean agree. But as you go further into the breakdown of what that word means, it actually means to praise. And so when I confess and when I exile a when I confess my faults, I'm actually rejoicing and I'm giving God praise. The Bible says it this way. We are overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. When I testify, I'm actually giving God praise. When I tell you how far the Lord has brought me from, I'm giving God praise. When I tell you how low the Lord had to bring me up from, I'm giving God praise. When I tell you how bad my mouth used to be, I'm actually giving God praise. When I tell you how angry I used to get, I'm actually giving God praise. Why? Because I'm not there anymore. Yes. We testify. We share our struggles. Why? Because it helps us to relate. We share our struggles. Why? Because it helps to rehabilitate. We share our struggles. Why? Because it gives me reason to rejoice that who I used to be, I'm no more. Or watch this, who I currently am, I don't have to continue to be. And I want to encourage you on today that if you don't know this God, first of all, that we have access to confess to. One thing that always bothers me is when people say, uh, I can't come to church yet. I got to get myself together. Well, no. If you can get yourself together without church, don't come to church. We don't mess you up. We still try to get it together. No. Uh, you, we came to God because we need him to help us get together. We came to God again. It's the one thing we all have in common. We all have sinned and we missed the mark. We, didn't, we don't just gather on Sunday because we got it together. We gather on Sunday because we come to get it together. And so a part of that is confessing, God, I have a problem. God, I am a sinner. God, I need salvation. God, I need redemption. God, I need reconciliation. God, I need sanctification. God, oh, wretched man that I am, I need saving. Yes. It starts with a confession to God, but it doesn't stop with a confession to God. 
It continues with confession to one another. Why? Because that's what builds community. The reason we don't have deep connections in the church is because we don't have deep confessions. And so we have surface level relationships with one another because I really love your representative. I don't love the real you. Why? Because the real you makes me uncomfortable. But the real you should make me so uncomfortable that I want to do something about it. I'm so uncomfortable by who you are bound that I partner with you and walk with you until you become the you that's free. Why? Because whom the sun set free is free indeed. 